whomever is in the, 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 the seat of leadership never wants to necessarily relinquish it at any cost. And if it means hurting, killing, what have you, that's what goes on. And we are much, much um, closer living into those times right now. Welcome to Black Executive Podcast, where we share inspiration and actionable advice for Black creatives going pro. I'm your host, Jazz. With each episode, we'll chat with Black creatives thriving in entrepreneurship, corporate careers, and the nonprofit sector, all while building a network of Black creatives, six head nods apart. Enjoy the show, where the dreamers become doers and the aspiring become inspired. Let's get started. Welcome back, Creative Fam. I'm your host, Jazz, and today we'll be speaking with award-winning digital creative professional, Marcus Eubanks. Marcus is a photographer, journalist, and videographer. He's produced several documentaries, including Traveling to Witness a Dream, a documentary of President Obama's inauguration, HIV AIDS in Arkansas, Life in the African American MSM Community, and the Elaine Massacre of the summer of 1919, the latter being a piece that resulted in a well-deserved Emmy, making Marcus the first African-American videographer from Little Rock, Arkansas to receive an Emmy. Welcome to the show, Marcus. Hey, and that's in Arkansas, period. I just recently found out. Wow. So the entire state. Right. That's that's yes. awesome. Yes, what an accomplishment. Yep. But, but before we get into your long track sheet of professional work and accolades over the past two decades, can you talk a bit about your background and how you got started in media? Uh, well, um, gosh, I, I started in college. Um, I I went to college like most people and didn't know exactly what I wanted to go for. And I don't know if most people, but I didn't know. I didn't Mm -hmm. know. Um, I took the aptitude test in high school and it told me that because of my uh, aptitude in um, mathematics, that I would be a good uh, accountant. Hmm. And I thought, you know, okay, that's cool because I I was pretty good. I've been very good at math, but um, I didn't see myself sitting behind a desk for, you know, the rest of my life, you know? Right. Um, so I, I switched up and got into the mass communications, uh, discipline at the university of central Arkansas. And one of the first things that they did is had me do the, uh, color commentary for high school football games in Conway. Mm -hmm. Um, I fell in love at that point. You know, I was thinking like, okay, I'm gonna be the next Stuart Scott. I'm going to do this thing. And mm-hmm. I'm also an alpha, so the fact that he was an alpha as well, and I was like, wow, this is going to mm-hmm. be, you know, things are going to line up. Um, but then I picked up a camera, you know, another assignment was to go out and um, videotape and put together a small piece, which was a very short voice track, um, and, and get some video. And I fell in love, to be honest with you. Because I've always, even though I'm 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 pretty good at math and and other uh, general education subjects, I'm a creative, mm-hmm. right? And I've right. always written poetry. I've always done uh, little silly things, skits or what have you. But it was like grabbing a paintbrush and you know working a canvas with my paintbrush, shooting video. Right. Because there is a there is a discipline to video recording that, you know, some people get most people don't. But each shot should say something about the path Mm -hmm. that you're traveling or where you're trying to take the viewer. And to be able to do that, um, I just fell in love. That is very powerful. Can you talk more about that, like the power of visuals and storytelling? Because. I think that's underestimated how much of the storytelling is actually done by the videographer as well, not right. just the journalist or who's in front of the camera. Well, and and that's a huge part of that 
dance. I'll call it a dance because I've been a mm-hmm. reporter before, but then I, you know, uh, the majority of my career I spent working with uh, reporters. But mm-hmm. um, and I've seen good stories that didn't come out well because the visuals. Well, the reporter wanted to write one thing just to kind of get their part of the process done. Mm -hmm. But there was no video to support it. Um, And I've seen it as well where the video was powerful, but the reporter, I mean, the, the, the writing was powerful, but there was no video to support what um, was written. So Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a delicate song and dance, if you will. Um, And that's one of the things that happened with the uh, documentary. Um, it was a it was a great experience. Um, it was it was an emotion driven experience for me on two phases, but we can get into that here in a second. But as mm-hmm. far as it concerns the uh, creative process uh, and getting images that support um, what's being said, um, that is uh, th- that's paramount to have good journalism. And again, this was my first time entering, first time winning um mm-hmm. as far as uh, the emmy award is concerned but it's a it it's a skill honestly that i honed over the whole 20 years because um wow. initially i was just like any other novice or whatever i felt like okay i got video so you know we can cover but once i i got deeper into it um, i worked at three different well four different tv stations Mm-hmm. Um, I worked at Channel 4 in Little Rock, Arkansas, initially, right out of college. I worked in Memphis at uh, a TV station there, came back to Arkansas, worked the bulk of my career at um, Channel 11, and then I got out of the business and did my own thing production-wise, and then got back in in 2015. But the creative process in gathering video is is important. I, I, that's the only way that I can say it because angles make a difference. Um, mm-hmm. Lighting makes a difference. And there are, as far as photography is concerned, that discipline lends to video gathering or creation a lot more than most people think because mm-hmm. there are rules to photography, right? Lines and right. shapes and shades and color and all of those things make a difference when you are creating a or taking a still image. The same thing goes when it comes to um, video, because if you can master incorporating the principles of photography in your video production, mm-hmm. you then gave credence to what what even brought about video production right because it's it, right. it it started with photography and so once you grasp those concepts you can take your your image gathering to a totally different level okay so the foundation is photography and then from there you kind of evolve into this right. moving um uh, art which is videography there's a reason that they call it motion pictures, mm-hmm. motion photos, if you will, because it's 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 exactly that. If you ever like, it's so bad with me. Like certain when I'm watching movies or television shows or what have you, I can see mm-hmm. the foreshadowing in shots that they choose to, you know, start something. Mm. And, um, Interesting, right? And it's it's it. Having been in this so long, I, I watch television with a different eye. With with that being said, do you feel like knowing that like they're choosing certain angles or whatnot, do you feel like there are ethical and unethical ways to go about gathering visuals for your work? Definitely. I mean, there's a oath as far as journalism is concerned that many journalists don't adhere to Hmm. because things have changed since the beginning. Right. Um, Yeah, definitely. But the oath basically is to do no harm. That's our first and original 
process, uh, a part of the process of journalism, videography being a part of that. Mm -hmm. Um, But now where it concerns, you know, uh, the sensationalism of storytelling to get eyes on the screen, um, Mm -hmm. things have stepped way far away. And again, I've been in the business for 20 years. So when I got in the business, I was working with people who had been in the business for about 10 years so mm-hmm. or 20 years. So from that aspect, the the experiential uh, deference that I have in the business probably can be stretched to about 40 years. Because mm-hmm. if you think about it, those people, you know, came in 10, 20 years before me. They brought their skill set and and mindset to the business, having been in it for that amount of time. Well, you know, mm-hmm. as a a, a budding uh, professional, you're taking cues from them, right? Right. And that's part of why or how I start to understand how much photography was a part of videography at my third station at Channel Eleven gentleman by the name of Oren Hardcastle was our chief photographer. But Mm -hmm. at one point in time in Little Rock, he was like one of the top still photographers. Wow. And so he brought those principles to the table and and talked about aperture and talked about lighting and talked about depth of field and all of those things that uh, make a good image, make a compelling image. And he brought those things to the table. So as I grew I started to understand, you know, this all flows. And once you get all Mm -hmm. of those pieces in it, I think, honestly, that's one of the things that set that my documentary uh, with Elaine apart Mm -hmm. because I was going full bore because I knew the subject matter was strong. And then on top of that, it was uh, it was an emotional time for me because I had just lost a relative of mine. And so. Mm. And in the process, because I lost him the day before my birthday in 2017, when Mm. I returned to work on the 13th, they gave me this assignment and said I would be going to do that. And at that point, I said, I'm putting everything into this production Mm -hmm. as a as a point of remembrance for him. Mm hmm. Yeah. So that that was also like a, a catharsis for you, right? To yeah. be able to have to do that. And and for listeners who don't know about the Lane Massacre, it was um very tragic and you should look it up. But um it was this huge massacre of African Americans who were sharecroppers and they were really just trying to unionize and fight for basic rights. <laughs> you know, and, and I think that's what's so heartbreaking about it is, is that it's like they weren't even asking for much they were just wanted to be treated fairly right you know you're thinking about reconstruction where and this is something that i i i I hearken back to when i talk to people about um current times right um Mm -hmm. and that the person in power is not going to give away their power lightly right yes so true and not that uh, and not that I understand because so many African Americans all, all across the country, as a matter of fact, during that summer of 1919, between the summers of 1917 and 1921, there were massacres all over the country uh, mm-hmm. after doing the research about it. But the, the, the whomever is in the, 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 the seat of leadership never wants to necessarily relinquish it Mm -hmm. at any cost. And if it means hurting, killing, what have you, that's what goes on. And we are much, much um, closer living into those times right now. I'm looking at the things that are going on with uh, African Americans being Mm -hmm. gunned down by police. Yeah. I'm sorry, that was an aside. (laughs) No, I totally that's that's totally relevant. Um, I think one thing is important to remember, like it with anything with history, is that those lessons seem so far away 
it, mm-hmm. you know, but they're still applying today. Like they're, it's still happening today. And it's scary to compare sometimes the seemingly little amount of progress that we've made. <laughs> it is it's such a, a something that should be a long period of time. And, and yet we're not where we need to be. Yep. Yep. Definitely. I mean, because I mean, we're still fighting for seems like basic rights. I mean, yes. it's like they teacup or spoon feed us a little bit at a time. And then, you know, there are times like now where it seems like they're taking away even those things that were supposedly given to be, um, you know, a definite thing that we could count on. Now that's even mm-hmm. changing. So, but I think that all kind of goes to leadership as well. So. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're you're clearly very passionate about this and you could tell from your list of work that you're just passionate in general about the black community and um different issues that plague us and, and that we have to manage. Can you talk about um how important it is or how you use your work to bring awareness to important issues like the Elaine massacre and HIV awareness and domestic violence awareness, et cetera? Gosh. <sighs> I'm I'm a big softy. Let me just say it. Let me, <laughs> let me start there. Um, I've always been a, a very emotional person. Man, boy, whatever. Um, mm-hmm. and, and just from that, when I see suffering um, on any level, it, it affects me, right? Um, mm-hmm. It it gets into my spirit and, you know, truthfully, um, the documentary probably wouldn't have happened. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the point though, but, um, in 2014, 2015, Mm -hmm. there became, there was a rash of 14 and 15 and 16 year olds that were, involved in murders and involved in uh, bank robberies. And I'm watching this on the news and I'm just, I'm floored and flabbergasted because at 14 and 15, I was, you know, talking to girls and and playing football. Right. And so that was one of the major reasons that I even came back into journalism because again, I stepped away from it, but Mm -hmm. my soul was, was aching. Right. And I wanted to do something. Right. I wanted to to be a part of the solution, all of this. And uh, one of the things that I also brought to the table um, I, when I first got back to the TV station, I hounded the news director about, you know, doing something community wise that could help um, address the issues that were going on with, you know, the youth here in Little Rock. And of course, from there, you know, nothing really happened. But when um, Asen King and Ramiah Reed, two two two-year-olds, were gunned down in drive-bys. Oh, my goodness. He finally understood kind of what I was saying. And, you know, we took the process forward and, and did the brainstorming and came up with the victory over violence program that uh, is still a part that. of, yeah, it's still a part of what channel four and channel 16 does as a news organization, even though I'm not there anymore. Mm-hmm. But um, it was one of the things, I mean, I, again, just a big softy. And when I see something, I want to do something. And the uh, inauguration of Barack Obama, that was a uh, a point to me where I felt like African-Americans could could celebrate, you know? Yes. Yes, definitely. When that happened, uh, it was like, yes. And then the documentary about uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic in the mm-hmm. uh, MSM community, I didn't, I wasn't aware of, of, of that subject matter. I was approached by somebody, the actual director of the uh, health 
Arkansas Department of Health at the time, Kevin Detner. Well, I don't think he was the the director. He was he was over some portion of it, but he's a mm-hmm. fraternity brother of mine. Um, also, our, uh, we were went to Central High School. Um, oh, together. also Central alumni here. <laughs> Go yeah, Tigers! Yeah. <laughs> always, always. Hail to the old gold. Hail, Hail to, to the, the black. black. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I didn't know much about it. But then once I kind of got in and, and talked to the guys and, 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 and saw how they're trying to live their lives mm-hmm. best that they know how. Right. And some of the things that they're subjected to abuse and, and, and uh, some at, you know, at certain points were being hunted down and killed or mm. found dead. And and then the HIV epidemic, you know, that was a portion of it. That, that was the whole backdrop that started the conversation. I'll say it that way. Mm-hmm. And then from there, um, you know, to, to hear some of their stories, it, it was heart wrenching. Um, and then domestic violence, you know, there's a story that that um, affects me, encompasses and, and, and has a, a, a stick in the coffee, a stir in the coffee, mm. if you will, of domestic violence. And, you know, it was, uh, that has, that affected my life forever. Yeah. And the event that happened, uh, it affected my life up until the point of, uh, well, really still today. Mm-hmm. But um, and, and I was about three years ago, I got some some counseling and I, and I understood that um, an event that happened when I was three years old was still haunting me up to the age that I was 42. Yeah, childhood trauma is real. Right, right. And so um, once I realized it, I was able to, you know, adjust Mm -hmm. better because I was having some some uh, physical reactions to certain stimuli. And I didn't understand why at the time. I Mm -hmm. I just it didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know. Uh, after looking into and addressing that, uh, I, I understood, and it no longer has any power over me anymore. Mm-hmm. But um, I just think that, you know, had I had I had that information that I got when I was forty two, if I'd have got that information at twenty four, mm. you know, the difference that it might have made in my life. Yeah, but. Um, and then as it concerns the Elaine massacre, um, I had heard about it before. I, I have a, uh, an associate that has some relatives that are from that area and, but nobody was talking about it. Hmm. And I mean, it was weird as well. That town is like going back in history because there's a, there was a restaurant there in that town that still didn't serve blacks. Wow. Like in recent times. When we went up there in 2017. Wow. There's one restaurant in that town. They do not to this day serve black people. My at least goodness. At, at that time. I don't know if with the centennial coming up and more uh, attention being brought to that town, if that has changed or not. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and then there's a, you know, there's a distinct line, if you will, in that town where white people live and black people live, we rode through the black neighborhoods and people were staying in a house that basically was, had a hole in the wall. They were Mm -hmm. living in there. So um, that was a, That was an interesting, uh, and I've seen a lot being in journalism mm-hmm. for the amount of years that I have. I'm been. sure. But that was one of the most stomach-turning 
uh, stories that I've ever covered. And I've seen, you know, blood and guts and shootings and all of this other stuff. But Mm -hmm. to think about the history of that town and then to be in that town and to feel Mm. what it felt like to be in that town as a black man. Yes. Traveling with a a white reporter. Mm. Um, you know, it was weird to, to, as to how people would drive up and pass us and, you know, kind of look at us and speed off really fast and, you know, big Mm. trucks rumbling their engines, but. And you were with a a white female reporter, correct? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Ashley Ketz. Mm -hmm. Ashley Ketz was her name. She's actually an anchor Mm -hmm. um, at the TV station at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So. Wow. That, that is a lot. I mean, and, and it's crazy that those towns still exist. Um, my family, my family is from a small town in Mississippi on my father's side. And it, right. it's similar in the way in which in the nineties, they just got to the point in which, um, the blacks and whites lived on the same sides of the train tracks. There were, there are train tracks that go through the middle of the town and they, the, the white folks used to live on one side and the black folks lived on another. And that blew my mind that this was like, I was alive during the time <laughs> in which this was happening. Um, and, and I think a lot of times people forget about that when you live in these big cities or they don't even know that places like this still exist. Like, and they, they hear about these places on TV and fiction or, you know, sundown towns and fiction and, and don't understand that these are real. They were real and still are real in a lot of areas. Right. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So with with that being said, there are clearly a lot of challenges that, that come with your work, but it can also be very rewarding. Can you talk about some of the most rewarding and challenging parts of, of your work that you've experienced so far in your career? Well, first and foremost, most awarding was the Emmy Award. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but very close second. If probably, I'll say if they would have had victory over violence been what I really hoped it would be. Mm-hmm and not a ratings grab on some ends, if it was really what I wanted to be, that probably would have been my, my greatest accomplishment Mm. because it was a point where I, I've always had big ideas, right. And Mm -hmm. this time I felt even, you know, from, from God blessing it to come through my mind that it was too big for me to hold by myself. Mm. And so when we rolled out and asked for the first uh, group of people interested in it to come out and the library at Central was standing room only Wow! with all of the people interested wanting to get involved, who had their own organizations, who had um, just concerned citizens and parents and students and kids, to see the outpouring mm. of interest in, in, in what that idea was, um, that floored me. Mm-hmm. And from there, it... Um, you know, you know, I just, I was like, wow, I did something right. I'm not saying that I haven't, you know, done some, tried to do some amazing things by people, right. for people, or what have you. But that one was, it to see something that I kind of thought up, get that type of interest, mm-hmm. um, it was big. And... That was probably one of the most rewarding to see all of those faces of people and, and prominent people mm-hmm. who were interested in being involved. Um, that was huge for me. Um, 
I guess I don't know something what the the award and and victory over violence. I would yeah. have to say those would probably be the two that I mean because of course at that point in my career I was seasoned, I was senior, I mm-hmm. had you know grown man thoughts if you will. Yeah. <laughs> about uh, uh affecting my community and and trying to see people in a better stead than than what they were Mm -hmm. and affecting the minds of 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 younger people because you know if you let a young person know that you care about their well-being most of not in all cases but most of the time that's going to give them the impetus to to try at least yes i agree you know so um that's what I wanted victory over violence to be about, to, to let the youth know that, hey, you know, yes, we're older and you may think that we don't understand your plight or what you're going through or what you have to deal with. But we've been there on some level. Now, to to be just frank with you, 2014 was much different than 1994. Mm-hmm. Um, well, in Little Rock, prop, well, actually, it was. It was not. It was that was one of the other things that I that kind of jumped to my attention a, a cyclical sickness mm. um, in Little Rock um, because in 1992 to 94, you know, the gang violence yeah. was running rampant in Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah, um, banging in Little Rock. And that's, Right. That's the time that I was, you know, coming up, uh, graduating high school. And I'm seeing many of my friends that I played little league football with or what have you gunned down or killing people and going to jail and strung out on drugs. And so Mm -hmm. I'm seeing this whole litany of things of people that I've been connected to in one way or another, um, I'm I'm seeing their lives changed, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so in 19, I mean 2014 to see these younger kids uh escalating even, you know, murder and, mm. and bank robberies and I you know, it it just affected me. That's all I, I that's the best way that I can put it. It affected me and I was I wanted to do something about it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I did anything or not, you know, truth be told, but I'm just thankful for, for the heart God has given me. And, and don't be, that's a word. Confused. Yeah. Don't be confused. I'm not a saint standing around here. Mm-hmm. I have my, I have my own uh, vices, yeah. if you will. Yeah, I get that. But at the same time, uh God blessed me with a caring heart. Now, that has been good and bad at certain points in time in my life. <laughs> yeah, I can relate. I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, that being the case, you know, I just, I feel for people. I, I, I love, like, there was a point in time when I would just every so often just to kind of put the energy out there and just say, you know, I love y'all, I love y'all, yeah. I love y'all, I love y'all. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, and it's not a, obligatory. It's not just me, you know, saying something. Mm-hmm. I just think if you hear it more, you can feel it in a different way. And hopefully it affects you. Mm-hmm. Not saying that it, it will everybody, but hopefully it will give you a little bit more push, a little bit more fight to kind of see and do and 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 and, and be, you know. Mm-hmm. And whether whether it's about achieving anything or just doing your daily run and handling your business. Um. Yeah, I mean it's. It, It's purposeful. I'll say it that way when I say I love you. Yeah. I mean, and it seems like from what you've said about like your work and and clearly the work that you've done is all very purposeful for you. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you have this 
pure intention and hoping that something that you've done will impact someone's life. And with you having such a huge effect by being a part of the media, which we know permeates so many crevices of the community, I'm pretty sure yeah. it's like you've affected some change within the community. I'd like to think so, but mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I'm not standing on some stage of grandeur and, <laughs> and thinking like mm-hmm. I've done this and I've done that. But I would like to, I would like to hope that, mm-hmm. um, the 20 years of my life that I've spent in and around the media or production or um, photography or, I mean, even with my photography, I hope that, you know, some of the people that I've had the opportunity to capture, they just, they felt beautiful at that moment, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and happy with the image that they saw of themselves in the time that I spent with them. Mm -hmm. Um, So, if if I've affected positively, I won't even say that. If I've affected people, period, mm-hmm. God be the glory. Yes, yes, definitely. I I understand it. Just just an impact, just right. a bit. I mean, and even the victory over violence. You know, it may not have gone the full direction of what you wanted, but like the the legacy of it being in existence. And like the community outpour that you received from some of your events and things like that, just sometimes just like the way that you were affected. I'm sure there are other people that were in awe of the turnout and the support and, you know, just seeing the community get behind something, especially during times where it seems like everything is so divisive. Right. Yeah. And that was a rough stretch here in Little Rock. Um, Mm -hmm. Police were 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 over policing in some situations, right. and, well, which they still do at certain points in time. I think uh, my frat brother, Mayor Frank Scott, is doing a, a wonderful job as the mayor of Little Rock. Um, yeah, he's a but, great guy. Yeah, but um, and no, no, he didn't graduate from Central. I think he went to Parkview. he went to Parkview with my brother. I know Frank. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. That's what's up. That's what's up. But um, I just think that we are given a certain amount of days to do God's work. Mm-hmm. Um, funny story. Well, not funny. Uh, this is my life. I I really wish we could do a whole long thing because I got so much to say. But I'll say I'll, I'll tell you this. I could bring you back always. <laughs> <laughs> On my eighth birthday, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I was involved in a car accident, mm. and I was I was a latchkey kid, right? Yeah. So I I get home and I'd be the only one there. Yeah, me too. And it was my birth. It was my birthday, my eighth birthday, and I got home and nobody was there. And I walked to a friend of mine's house um, that stayed across a very busy thoroughfare in Little Rock. Now, my birthday is in October, and if you if you've been to Little Rock, Arkansas, you know usually without COVID being in existence, um, the Little Rock, the Arkansas State Fair goes on. Yes. And so I stayed in the shadow of the fairgrounds and I took it upon myself to go over a friend of mine's house to see if I could play because I didn't want to be by myself mm-hmm. on my birthday, you know. And that's the Roosevelt area, right? Right. Ooh. So it was late. It was getting late and I knew my mom got home at a certain time and I wanted to beat her back home. So... I make my way back home and I'm standing at the corner of Roosevelt and Marshall. Now the streets are busy as all get out because that that's prime time. That that's rush hour. That's fair time. Mm-hmm. So cars everywhere. Yeah. A little kid, not really sure that he should even be there. I thought I saw an opening where I could run out and across the street. And I got hit by a pickup truck. Oh, my goodness. 
going about 45, 50 miles per hour going down a hill. Wow. My God. Um, so I was, you know, luckily I didn't die. Yes, um, that's a I blessing. That's only by the grace of God. Mm. Um, I was in a coma for 18 hours and mm. my mom said I, I limped for about six weeks after I left the hospital. But I said all that to say this. I said God is, you know, we have a certain amount of days that God gifts us with to do his work. Mm -hmm. I've known all my life from that point um, that there's some God's work to be done through me. Yes, say that. And indeed, the fact that I didn't die on that day, uh, I just remember back to waking up wanting something to eat because <laughs> mm. I was hungry. Mm. But um, on that day, I didn't know it then, but I, as, as I got older and I started to think about it, and strangely enough, when I got into TV, as a videographer, I saw, because I've been in several accidents, actually, mm. but I saw every accident, I saw the result, if you will, mm. of every accident that I had ever been in, but not turn out the same way. And I was behind the camera videotaping death. Ooh, ooh, that's powerful. But God, but God saw fit to wake an eight-year-old up mm. after one of the most traumatic experiences that, I mean, you just, I don't understand how I was able, uh, how I survived that. I just don't. You had a calling over your life. That's the only thing that I can think. Yes. That's the only thing that I think about. With all my struggles and, 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 and you know, certain things that go have gone on in my life. I just know, keep going. Mm. Just keep going. Yes. Yes. When you have a greater purpose and, a, and a, a greater mission and, and that's so power to powerful to even recognize that because so many people live their whole lives, you know, aimlessly, not really knowing what, like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know if there is a purpose at all, but you know, even if you didn't know exactly to the T, this is what it is I'm supposed to be doing. You knew there was a higher calling over right. the work that you were sent to do. Right. Yeah. Because I had no idea what it would be. Mm -hmm. Because again, I didn't, I had no clue what I wanted to do when I went to college. None. My mom just was like, you smart, you going to school. <laughs> <laughs> I understand um, that. I had, I had no clue what I wanted to do with, with my life professionally. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, again, passion worn out and, you know, I, I, I would like to think even with all my vices, right. I, I don't, I don't want anybody to hear this who knows me and be like, oh, he ain't <laughs> even with all of my vices. <laughs> okay. Um, I feel like. I I just have been placed to do God's work. Mm -hmm. So, yes, and and that is a powerful calling, not only to have over your life, but also your career, right? To be so driven to know, like literally, the work, as in the work for monetization that I'm doing, is also a part right. of what I'm supposed to be doing as a calling for my life. That is so powerful. Yeah. Now, and and plenty of people would probably tell you I could be more humble about it. But <laughs> <laughs> hey, you have an Emmy. You have bragging rights, <laughs> <laughs> baby. Look, I was this way before the Emmy. <laughs> I mean, but that just I'm, added I'm, to I'm, it. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> if you listen, no, I'm sorry. I, I, no, I'm I get that. Hey, hey, confidence is everything, right? Yeah. Now that that that's something that I'm not in short supply of. Never have. <laughs> and you know, but the weird thing is this though. Um, it, it, there are not a lot of people that have confidence, yeah. truthfully, right? Right. In themselves. Mm-hmm. And when they see somebody who is as boisterous and, and sometimes precarious as I am, it almost seems like they resent it, but you know, mm-hmm. I've I've learned over the years that you just got to be who you are. Yes. And let the chips fall where they will. Yes. Especially being in a field like yours and you're having to mm-hmm. like, you know, take on these different stories and interact with all these different people with varying opinions <laughs> and beliefs. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, it could be easily to, yeah. to lose a sense of who you are and your moral compass. Right. Yeah. Because, look, I've been called the N-word on more than one occasion out on mm. a story. <laughs> My goodness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at at this point, you would think people have learned that word has been used so much negatively. Like, what power does it have? You know, like at this point, it's like you really you, you still want to go there. <laughs> That's all you got. Yeah. You, you you mad about what are you mad about right now? Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. So I, we know we're getting uh, close to time to wrap up. So one thing that I wanted to touch on uh, quickly before we wrapped up is. Yeah, earlier you said that you you stepped away from journalism for a while and did your own thing and then you came back. What what kind of sparked that need to take a break and what sparked the I know you kind of talked about the decision to come back was about your passion, but what made you kind of step away in the first place? Um wow. Uh when I originally stepped away, um I had I had made the transition from um, behind the camera to in front of the camera. Uh, for about two years, I was reporting and shooting video um, mm-hmm. at Channel 11. Now, uh, that came with some different challenges because, again, I've been behind the camera and the people who knew me knew I worked at the TV station, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then the exposure of actually being on TV um, it seemed like people felt like it gave them a license to approach me mm. uh, in 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 public. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will never forget it. We were going to see Disney on Ice. I was taking my daughter to see Disney on Ice, and we were in the crowd in the line going up to get the tickets or what have you, and somebody was in the crowd, and they yelled out, Marcus Eubanks. I looked around. Nobody kind of rose up to say hey. Mm. And so I turned around, and they yelled again, Marcus Eubanks. And I looked again, and nothing. And I'm there with my daughter. So now at this point, I'm feeling, I'm in yeah. defense mode. Yeah, protective mode. That's your baby. Exactly. Right. And... They did it again, and I didn't turn around that time. And then they said, you shouldn't have your face all over TV if you don't want folks to know you. Wow. And I was like, huh. And again, this is my hometown. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people in in, in Little Rock um, who've gone away and come back and and, and new people who come from other places. Mm -hmm. Um, But that angered me that I could be out with my child and people would act like that. And again, yeah. I grew up in Little Rock. I, I grew up around the banging area mm-hmm. era in Little Rock. I, you know, I came from a side of town that was not the greatest. So I understand 
about keeping my head on a swivel. Right. And, you know, that was, that was an interesting experience and it, it, it upset me and, and, and several other things, but the thing about it, it was that, and then certain inside pressures Hmm. that were going on at the TV station, because again, you think about who I am and my background, and I'm a black guy, and I'm at a I'm in a white organization, and I'm mm-hmm. I'm making strong moves, and I was one of the first uh, one of the first videographers to be on TV in Little Rock as well, mm-hmm. as far as like on camera making the transition at the TV station. Yeah, but. I noticed how a certain level of success will make people that you've had certain relationships with prior, it will change them. Mm. I had what I thought was some really good friends um, at the TV station, but as I started to kind of go up and do really good work, some better than, you know, some of the writing but again, because I've written poetry and several, you know, I have a, I have a bit of discipline in writing. Right. I, I know how to craft words. Mm-hmm. And so some of my stuff would come out a little bit better than some of the reporters that were seasoned. Mm-hmm. So then it, you know, the, the dynamics change. Oh yeah. And then jealousy and truthfully competition. Right. Right. <laughs> And at that point, truthfully, I was like, I've been in this business for 10 years at that point. I know I have my own camera. I have my own microphones. I have my own lighting gear. Why don't I just go and do my own thing? Yeah. And so I did. I mean, it was a stress reliever. (laughs) (laughs) I understand that. It was a stress reliever getting out at that time. Yeah. Yeah. When you came back after everything, did, was it a better experience for you? It was totally different because okay. all of a lot of the, well, and I say different, good and bad, mm-hmm. because a lot of the older, more seasoned people, I was one of the older, more seasoned people then. Yeah. Even though I hadn't been in the business for five years, uh, six years almost. But um, I was the seasoned person in the newsroom with a lot of Mm 20-somethings and who knew it all, who, you know, (laughs) our eyes shot, da-da-da-da-da-da, okay. (laughs) Which, you know, I I had to make an adjustment to that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But the game had changed like from a technology standpoint, it it changed Facebook and and Twitter and, and all of these social media uh, platforms were now a part of what you need to do in your daily routine to, to put information and content out. Right. It shifted. But you know, the strange thing is back in 2000 and 2007, when Facebook came about, I was like, wow. I thought to myself, before long, this is where people are going to come and get their news. This yeah. is where they're going to come and get their information because, like, who wants to sit around and wait until 5 or 6 o'clock to know about what's going on? Yeah, I'm guilty of that. I can't tell you the last time I've watched an actual news station. My mom cannot right. stand it. <laughs> She's like, turn on the news, know what's going on. I'm like, it'll come on my feed or I'll get it to my iPhone in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, technology changed. At that time, that was like, a, and it was, you know, I, I was really taking a chance. Because at that time, that's when the, 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 the first recession, first recent recession happened mm-hmm. in 2009. Yeah. Car dealerships shutting down and businesses and da 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 mm-hmm. uh, Subprime loans with homes and all of those things, they started to affect the economy. But I stepped out and I did, I did pretty well. Uh, and, you know, I didn't lack for having something to eat. I'll say it that way. Yeah. Uh, 
But, you know, it's been a journey. It's been a, it's been a journey. I, I, that's the best way that I can say it. It's been a journey. Look, that's the best way to live. Gives you lots of stories to tell. Many, many yeah, stories to I tell. Do. I have a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So what advice do you have for aspiring Black creatives who are looking to do purposeful work in media? Mm. Wow. Well, one, you have to have a heart for purpose, right? Mm-hmm. So, because every, I mean, creativity is one thing, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think there are a lot of people that are really creative, but, you know, you, at this point, I have a calling card um, that is steeped and connected to the Black experience. Mm -hmm. Um, But that is something that, was instilled in me um, years ago um, in a program called Upward Bound. Ah, yeah, I'm familiar with Upward Bound. At at Philander Smith, yeah. You know, just some of the people that I had connection or made connections with in my teen years. You know, I'll I'll say it this way. My household, my mom had white friends. Now, we really never talked about black issues right Mm -hmm. but when i got to upward bound and we start talking about fannie lou hamer and we started talking about pouring libations and we'd start talking about ancestors Mm -hmm. my mind changed Mm -hmm. so when i say creatives have to have a heart to have the passion You have to be able to grasp who you are, what you are, and when you are. Mm. Because there is a certain appointed time that God chooses his people to do his work. Mm. And if you're not listening, if you don't make yourself available you might miss it. You might miss your call. So if you're a creative and you uh, you have to understand what who we are in the first place as creatives, mm-hmm. right? We have always been the rebels. We have always been the people who... Uh, infected or evoked change yes the creatives have been those people right Mm -hmm. and and whether it's in art i mean whether it's in painting whether it's in music we have always been at the keyboard if you will of the struggle Mm -hmm. we always have been and so if you are a creative you must have passion because there's one thing that I know because I've experienced it. I've done good work over my years, but it wasn't until my heart was broken and I lost my brother Mm. that everything that I, it seemed like every single thing, all the all the fights that we had, right? Mm -hmm. All the disagreements that we dealt with and all of the problems that he had because, again, he died in prison. Mm -hmm. All of those things were running through me during every shot that I took when I was shooting that documentary. Mm -hmm. style. It was a documentary-style news story, but Mm -hmm. every shot I was thinking about him, but I was also thinking about the discipline and my mind was racing and things just couldn't go fast enough and and the connection and the the push and the power, all of that energy was encompassed and pressed out on that 
peace. Mm. So if you're a creative and you have passion, the amount of work that goes into whatever you're doing is only as big as you mm. and your heart. Yes, that is a word. Like, I feel like you have just given a whole sermon this episode. Like, <laughs> we just went to church this episode, creative church in here. <laughs> <laughs> all right so last thing how can people find you online to keep pace with your creative journey uh now i'm a goofball so i do certain little stuff on facebook i'm on uh instagram uh you can find me on facebook at uh marcus life's too short um you can find me on instagram at 4 X underscore Fitzgerald 1906. That's my middle name. I tried to give y'all a little something right there. <laughs> um, gosh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, gosh, I have to look at my Twitter name. Give me a second. Look, that's how we know you're not active then. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little active. I'm a little <laughs> um, on uh Twitter, I am hat. I mean, at shoot the number two trill t r i l l, and I have a picture of me holding my Emmy. So <laughs> that's how they know it's you. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Do you have blankets and sheets at your house with you and your Emmy on it? <laughs> Almost, you know, <laughs> get out of my decorative skills. Now. Don't bother me. <laughs> I don't blame you. If I had an Emmy, I had pictures up everywhere. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. I'm glad that you were able to come on the show and, like, really just hit us with so many powerful words about the importance of being passionate about your work and striving to do purposeful work. I know that there's somebody out there who's listening to this who needs to hear this, especially at a time where you hear so many negative stories about the media. It's good to know there are people who care, you know, about their work and their craft who work in the media. Right, right. Well, and, and you know, for, the, for, for years I was at, you know, when I was at the TV station, um, you know, it, again, being black and understanding the black experience and really having been given the uh, responsibility mm -hmm. from uh, black people as I was coming up to understand who I am. And it's mm -hmm. not, it's not me walking and going into these jobs and, and, and doing a job for the people that I work for, I'm a representative, right? Mm -hmm. And so when it, one of the reasons the news directors who were all white in Little Rock, one of the reasons they, that they did not like me because was when it came time to speak up for black people, I was always right there up front. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, you know, a lot of us get our jobs and get our money and we're good and whatever happens, oh my gosh, that's bad. But not a lot of us step up and speak up. Yes. I was always the one to step up and speak up. Mm. Yes, that is important. That's so important. It's, it's not enough to just stand by. Like, you really need to say something and be a voice, especially when you're in a space in which, you know, you're re you're representing so many of us. Mm -hmm. And I know it. that's a weight we don't want to have to carry, but sometimes we have to. We carry that weight. Yeah, it's our, I mean, as I said, I was told by um, the established, educated, 
black people that I came in contact with at Upward Bound and thereafter at UCA, uh, Umpata, um, Theman Taylor, that when we go out, we are a representative of our mm-hmm. ancestors. Yes, we are. And one of the things uh, Mr. Theman Taylor would always say, and Dr. Uh, Patricia McGraw, represent. They mm-hmm. would say, represent. Mm-hmm. Yes. So represent. I feel like, you know, for good or bad, for better or worse, for whether people liked what I said or not, I represented us. Yeah. Yeah. And it's needed. It's needed. What a word we have received today. Marcus came through and hit us with a sermon with some powerful words about the importance of being passionate about your work, which is so important. So as usual, I'm going to hit you with five key takeaways to get you out the door. Number one, When in the public sphere, be prepared for the challenges of being a public figure and know when to draw the line for the sake of the privacy and protection of your loved ones. So Marcus specifically spoke about an incident that happened that caused him to step away. And he took a break and with that in combination with other things. But when he came back, he chose strategically to stay behind the camera more so than in front of the camera because of that. So if you are in a public facing position, be mindful of the effect that that may have on your family and potential challenges that could come with that. Number two, know when to measure impact versus intention. And a lot of times we hear the phrase that it's not about, you know, the intention it's about the impact. But I think in this particular example, you know, with Marcus not being able to measure the lies that he particularly affected, you know, it could make you feel like you don't have much of an impact if you're in a situation similar to his. But the intention behind the work and the responses you receive from the community can help you view the quality of change brought on by your work. There is power in being the spark that inspires the community. Number three, Do work that you are truly passionate about and that resonates with your spirit. When you operate under a greater purpose for your work, you move differently. That is not a call to religion. It doesn't matter what your beliefs are. Religious-wise, it doesn't matter if you think life is all random chaos or if you think it's all strategically and divinely ordered. What matters is that you, for your personal journey and your career as the creative and your work, you find deeper meaning in why it is that you do what you do. Number four, identify who you are in relation to the world and to your work. Knowing who, when, and where you are in your life journey can help make sense of your career. Marcus spoke a lot about knowing his history, knowing how important his work was, and knowing how important his work was to his community. And that deeply impacted the way that he went about his work and that drove a lot of his decisions when he faced challenges in the workplace. So understanding that, that knowing who you are, when you are, and where you are is impactful to your overall career direction. And number five, use your craft as a form of trauma healing. When you're going through hardship, pour that energy into your art and create something beautiful. Marcus lost his brother, an important figure in anyone's life. And he spoke a lot about that experience and how he used that energy to pretty much drive completing the Elaine massacre and being able to provide a voice for the voiceless of those whose family members were lost. So just know that if you're going through something in the middle of your creative journey, in the middle of your career journey, you have two options. You can either dig deeper into it and get further and further depressed and lose yourself and lose your art and lose your work in it. Or when the doors close, you can choose instead of turning around and getting lost in the darkness, look for that very thin sliver of light that lets you know that there's something on the other side of that door. Even if it's locked, there's something on the other side and let that give you hope. Let that spark something in you to drive you to complete your work for you, not for anyone else, not for your employer, not for your client, but for you. That's why you need to do work. 
that you're passionate about. That's all I have for today. As usual, I'm so glad that you stuck around for another episode of Black Executive Podcast. Be sure to visit us on blackexecutive.com, shop gear. And also, if you haven't already done so, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and share this episode or any other episode that you like with someone else. And lastly, if you have feedback, let your girl know. I want to hear from you. Tell me what you think, what you like, what you don't like. Any suggestions? I'm open for it. You can find me anywhere you find Black Executive on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Until next time, keep aspiring to inspire. Thanks for listening to another episode of Black Executive. If you enjoyed listening in on this convo, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you found us. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Black Executive. Have something to add to the conversation? Visit blackexecutive.com to leave feedback and your thoughts could be featured on a later episode. While you're there, pick up your exclusive Black Executive gear and rep the culture. And spread the knowledge. If you know a Black creative trying to go pro, a corporate mogul looking to advance, or a cousin that's always hustling but never gets an idea going, drop them a link to the show. Until next time, keep aspiring to inspire. <laughs>